Today we are going to take a look at some of the fundamentals of photography, uh, starting with the exposure triangle. Uh, exposure triangle is a term that you'll probably hear uh, quite a bit if you talk in the photography circles for any length of time. Um, and we'll get into what the triangle is and the three factors that go into that. Before we do that, though, just a quick reminder, um, looking at the characteristics that make up a strong image, we talked about this last week, uh, the New York Institute of Photography teaches that there are three factors that make up strong images. Um, every image should have a clear and identifiable subject. That subject does not need to be like a physical object that you can point to and say that is the subject. It doesn't need to be, you know, for example, a cardinal in a tree or uh, a fashion model in a studio or um, a race car going down the track. Uh, it doesn't need to be that concrete. It can be as simple as an emotion. You know, the, the theme might be love or the theme might be fear, but it should have some sort of subject that we are looking at. And that takes us into number two, that we as a photographer should be taking steps to focus attention on that subject. Uh, we can do that in a number of ways. We can do that with a lot of our different compositional techniques that we'll cover a little bit later on. Things like the rule of uh, thirds, things like color theory, framing, um, size of the subject within the frame, things like that. And finally, all images, uh, we as photographers should be taking steps to minimize distractions um, from that subject. So this is where you see in you know, amateur photographers, we'll see things like garbage cans sitting in the background of a beautiful image or a telephone pole sprouting out of the head of a subject. Um, we want to do things as a photographer that will eliminate those sorts of distractions as best as we possibly can. All right, so let's get into the exposure triangle. Um, this takes us back a little bit in history. Um, people were noticing as early as the fourth century BC that if you were in a dark room and had a small hole on one end of the room, um, the outside scenery would actually project through that hole and invert and show in uh, mirror form, upside down, reversed, uh, on the far wall. Um, Leonardo da Vinci, as early as the 1500s, um, has actually done a lot of sketches, a lot of drawings and diagrams on this very principle. The idea of being able to, to uh, capture an image. And then in theory, if you were to simply draw that image as you saw it, you could say put a piece of paper up on that wall and you could trace out the image. About a hundred years after da Vinci was drawing up all of these images of the phenomenon, um, Dutch inventor Cornelius Drebbel uh, took that same phenomenon, created it inside of a wooden box. And rather than a simple hole, he added a lens, um, a glass lens that would focus the image onto a mirror back here that would then project the image up onto the back of a glass plate. The benefit of the mirror um, was that it re-inverted the image so that the image that the artist was drawing would be um, no longer reversed. Um, this was done as early as the 1620s, and it is remarkably similar to the way that today's modern cameras work. Um, on the right side, you'll see an image of a modern camera. Uh, we still have a lens up on the front. Uh, modern lenses have a whole array of different glass elements uh, but they function to uh, cause a focused image to fall onto this mirror. Now, the mirror would then throw the image up into what is now the prism, which then redirects the image to the photographer's eye so that we can see the image to compose and, and see what we're shooting. In today's modern cameras, of course, we're no longer drawing the image, uh, but at the moment of exposure, this mirror right here flips up and out of the way, and the image now reaches the sensor plate, which is back here, and the digital sensor will actually record to its memory card uh, the image that we created. Now, this image also shows a secondary mirror right here, which is reflecting light down here, and that is because this particular image is looking at autofocus motors. Uh, we are not going to worry about autofocus motors tonight, 
Uh, we can get into that later in the course if we would like. Um, so you can ignore this piece for right now, but just realize that this mirror right here at the moment of exposure slips up out of the way, exposing the, the sensor to the image, which is then recorded to your memory card. So creating the perfect exposure really depends on how much light we need. Now it's clear that not all images need the same amount of light. Uh, if we look here in the middle, we would have what we would consider to be an average toned, not very light, not very dark, uh, mid-toned image. And that will be just fine for most cameras to capture. This image on the left, however, is a silhouette image which is quite clearly darker than an average tone. And while yes, there are highlights along the side of her face, it is predominantly a dark image. The exact opposite is true over here where we are looking at the woodpecker uh, against a snowy field of, of white, um, which is quite clearly much brighter than neutral or mid-toned uh, density. So the camera needs a way to account for how much light do we need to capture the scene. So we need to be able to quantify the amount of light in the scene to be able to make decisions. Ansel Adams created what he referred to as the zone system around 1940. Ansel Adams was famous for his landscape photography uh, as they settled the Western United States. In the zone system, Ansel believed that there were a range of tones from zero to 10, with zero being completely pitch black, detailless, uh, with no texture, all the way up to a zone 10, which was pure, absolute white with, again, no texture. All of the zones in between, there is some gradient between white and black that allows you to capture detail. In the zone system, each zone is exactly twice as much or half as much light as the zone that is next to it. So for example, zone five is half as bright as zone six. Zone six is twice as bright as zone five. Likewise, we can say that zone six is twice four times as bright as zone four, eight times as bright as zone three. So we refer to each one of these zones as a stop of light. So if I were shooting something at neutral and I wanted to add a stop of light, I would add exposure to make it one stop brighter or twice as bright. Now, this works really well for these average toned images. If we were to take all of the colors, all of the tones, lights and darks, blend them all together into some middle, um, middle color, average color for the whole scene, it would average out around zone five. Our cameras are calibrated so that all of our images average out to about zone five. So if we were to capture this image with a regular point and shoot camera, um, as far as the lights versus darks, the camera would capture a pretty accurate exposure. The issue that we run into is when our images are not average toned. This image, for example, is a much darker image. If we were to blend all of the tones together, the lights and the darks together, it would average out to about a zone two, which is three stops darker than the zone five. If we allow the camera to record the image without any sort of adjustments, it will suggest for us an image that is up to zone five. It will give us a, a set of shutter speed and aperture that will yield for us an image that is about a zone five. And what that will do is ultimately lead to an overexposed image. The same can be seen in this image of the woodpecker against the snowy field background. Uh, obviously this scene is quite a bit brighter than average. If we were to blend all the lights and the darks together, we would end up with a, an image that's somewhere around a zone eight. Uh, if we were to photograph this with our camera in one of the auto exposure modes, it will suggest a set of, of uh, shutter speed and aperture that will yield me a zone five. So that will end up creating an image that is one, two, three stops darker than what I would like it to be. Uh, the result 
would be an underexposed image of that woodpecker. So we have talked about the three different variables um, that impact an image as far as the light and darkness of the final image. Uh, we've talked about the aperture, which is how big the lens will open up. We've talked about the shutter speed or how, or how long the shutter stays open. And we also have this factor called ISO, uh, which is a measure of the sensitivity of the sensor. How much light does the sensor need in order to be able to record an accurate image. Uh, if we think of this, this pipeline here as our lens, uh, inside of our lens there is an opening that is called the aperture and it is variable. It can open up or close down depending on how much light we want to let through. Obviously if it's a larger opening it's going to let more light through just as if we were to open up this valve and let more water come through the pipe. Um, the other variable is shutter speed. And that obviously means the longer we leave the shutter open, the more light will reach the sensor if all other variables are equal. Just like if I were to turn on the faucet here in my water pipeline, um, the longer I leave that faucet running, the more water I will end up having collected in the bowl down here. So each of these three variables are inextricably linked to one another uh, in determining how much light or dark is in the final image. So if I were to adjust either the ISO or the aperture or the shutter speed, I would need to adjust one or both of the other variables in order to have the same amount of light in the final image. Um, so if, for example, I kept my ISO constant at, F8, or, excuse me, at 800 ISO, and I was shooting an image, say, at f1.4 for 1 1,000th 1, of a second. Let's say, for example, that I wanted to slide down two stops and shoot that same image at f2.8. I would have to then slow down my shutter speed by two stops to give myself the same amount of light reaching the sensor. So I might shoot it at, uh, instead of 1 1,000th, 1, maybe I would need to shoot it at 1 250th of a second to have an equivalent exposure. Likewise, if I'm shooting something at one second at ISO 800 and I wanted to get it faster to say a half second, I could do that by increasing my sensitivity one stop from 800 to 1600. The number of combinations that you can use uh, are pretty much limitless because all three of these variables can change. Bear in mind that each of these three variables will have a, an impact on the final appearance of the image, uh, which is what we'll talk about next week. Coming up next, we will take a look at each of the three variables that play a role uh, in that final image and how they impact that image. So up first, we'll take a look at ISO or the sensor's sensitivity. So go ahead and re return back to the Moodle and click on the link for ISO sensor sensitivity video.